Hi, my name is Daniela, and I am the physician assistant that will be first assisting in today's uh, demonstration of an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. When I first walk into the room, I do uh, put the radiolog radiological studies up for the patient. Uh, this patient did have an MRI, and the MRI corresponds with the surgical procedure. When the patient is brought into the room, she is transported onto the OR direct table. The anesthesiologist will use ultrasound to assist in the intrascaline block. Once the block is administered, positioning of the patient will begin. So now anesthesia will assist in in moving the bed to the correct positioning. This surgery is done in beach chair position. There are many different ways to, to, per, to perform an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. Here we do it in beach chair position. Up and over towards me. Let's wait for anesthesia though. Okay. One, two, three. The unit assistant will help with the positioning of the helmet. The helmet is the head holder. So I always make sure that, the, that her ears are free. You do not want the ear to get caught up in the head holder. I make sure her chin is leveled and her head is leveled and that the strap is right across her forehead. Good. The helmet should be nice and snug. We don't want her to move around during the surgery. So this is an OR direct table. The back of the table do, is, is able to be removed for the laterality, left or right. Um, I do remove the right side of the OR direct table to correspond with the initials and the laterality of the surgery. The kidney post will be placed against the patient's kidney. This aids, as support, uh, this aids in support of the patient to make sure she stays on the bed. The patient's bed is turned um, into the sterile field to allow access for both anesthesia and the surgeon. Okay, I use a 1010 drape to mark out the surgical site. We will use a chloroprep to sterilize the patient. I do not want any of the chloroprep to drip past the surgical site, so this will protect the patient. The foot pedals are now placed in the surgical field. One will control the shaver, the other one will control the arthroscope, which is the electrocautery. An ether screen is brought up to mark out the surgical field. The nurse will now perform the first wash of the patient with chloroprep, and then the first assistant, in this case the physician assistant, will perform the sterile wash once she's scrubbed. So after I sterilely scrub, I will now begin to prep and drape. The surgical tech will now put the gown on and the sterile gloves. The unit assistant will tie me up. Thank you. It's important not to drop your hands too far down or raise them too high. The sterile field is right here, right in the front of your body. The unit assistant will now hold the arm so I can sterilely prep the hand. This is a chloroprep stick that I am using. There are different ways to prep. Some places use betadine, some places use chloroprep. Um, you'll use what's available to you. Okay, you can turn the arm now, thank you. It's important to make sure you get every finger in between all of the web spaces. I wrap around the wrist. Okay, that looks good. The unit assistant will now let go, and I will continue the sterile prep. I do always start at the surgical site and then make my way down the arm. These chloroprep sticks are tinted orange to make sure you do get all parts of the, of the, la of the extremity. The last place you will prep is the underarm. Thank you. And then you will repeat the process with the second prep stick. Again, the underarm is the last place. Thank you. I will now roll the stockingette up past the elbow, and we will begin the sterile draping. The surgical tech will now place the down drape to mark out the sterile field. This is the second down sheet. So this is sterile. I can now put the arm down, and we will put the up sheet. It's always two sheets down, one sheet up. The drape, this drape will be placed over the ether screen. 
And now we do use a sticky drape, a sticky U drape. Okay, grab the arm, thank you. Go around the back. Make sure to make sure to expose the entire scapula to the medial, medial border of the scapula. Perfect. And the ether screen does help support the sterile drapes. This is the, st the second sterile sticky U drape. Okay. This drape is very sticky, so it's important to make sure you have the correct positioning the first time you put it down. It's very hard to remove it and then do it again. And again, we want to make sure we have as much exposure as possible for the surgeon. But I do always inspect to make sure we have enough space to work. And now I will place the arm holder on the patient. So this is the spider arm holder. There are different types of arm holders to assist in, in moving and using the patient's arm. This one will be placed over the forearm of the patient. It's Velcro. You do have to make sure the hand is wrapped around the arm holder. This is a styrofoam, a styrofoam protector. Um, the way the arm holder comes, there is a metal post. And you don't want the patient's hand to be wrapped around the metal post because during the surgery, um, during the surgery, you will need some, pro uh, some protectant for the patient. So we do place the styrofoam over the metal post, and then the patient's hand will go around the styrofoam. There are two Velcro straps, and these will be wrapped around the forearm as well. Make sure it's snug but not tight. You do not want to create a tourniquet of the patient's forearm. Okay. With this Velcro strap, hold the patient's hand into place. Let's do the uh, arm filter first. So now the unit assistant will bring out the spider post. This is not sterile, so Nina has made sure to sterilely drape the spider. And now we'll be able to use it during surgery. The spider does have an adapter that, uh, that meets with the spider arm holder. Once it's clicked into place, you can now move the spider. There's a blue, a blue ring that needs to be up. When it's up, it is locked. When it's down, it is unlocked. So always make sure it's locked during surgery. Otherwise, the hand can become loose during surgery. Just for extra support, I will now wrap a coban around the patient's arm. And I go to about the elbow. At this time, the surgical tech will throw the lines off the fields and the nurse will, the nurse will connect all of the water and tubing. And the surgical tech will make sure all of the tubing is correct and the water does run. The pump is set to the pressure uh, choice of the surgeon and the nurse will bring, now bring the screen down to the surgical field. Since this is an arthroscopy, you do need the screen to visualize the surgery. The first assistant will now check all the pedals, test the shaver to make sure all the pedals are connected and they work. And I will now test the electrocautery to make sure it's connected as well. All of the instruments are brought over to the front table. The surgeon will begin the procedure in the posterior, uh, in the posterior part of the patient. Uh, we will, he will, the first portal he will make will be a posterior portal, and that's the portal where he does introduce the camera, and he begins the diagnostic scope. So most of the time, they will inject some medication into that posterior portal. Um, the intrascaline block done by the anesthesia, anesthesiologist does not sometimes reach all the way in the back of the shoulder, so he will inject a little bit of lidocaine there. This is true for lateral decubitus position as well as beach chair position. I will now mark out the shoulder. I do find the posterior lateral border of the acromion. The lateral border of the acromion. Mm -hmm. I also do follow the clavicle. And then I do also mark out the AC joint. It's very common to do an AC joint resection with a rotator cuff. And I'll mark out the coracoid, which is in the front of the shoulder. Okay, perfect.
All right, so my name is Dr. Lawrence Galata. I'm a shoulder surgeon at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Today we're going to do an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. When I walk into the operating room, there's a couple things that I've expected my assistants to have set up. Uh, the first thing is having the correct imaging up on the board. When I walk into an operating room, the very first thing that I'm going to do is walk over to the radiology board. And I'm going to look at the imaging for the upcoming case. That's something that at least here at the Hospital for Special Surgery that we ask our assistants to have ready for us. The second thing is after I scrub, I, I come and check our setup. We have Nina here, who's our surgical tech for the case, and she's obviously a seasoned veteran at making sure that all these myriad of spaghetti wires and things like that are, are, are perfectly organized and aren't going to get tangled during the case. One of the important things is that she needs to make sure that they stay sterile throughout the entire case, and she needs to make sure that the ones that go to instruments that I'm going to use have enough slack for me to be able to get the instruments to all the areas around the shoulder to be able to use them without being tethered. Uh, it goes without saying, though you'd be surprised how often it happens, that all of these need to be hooked up to instruments that are uh, outside the surgical field. And for that, we use Sterling, our, our, um, nursing, our, our nurse in the room, to help us do. We make sure we have these foot pedals. These control a lot of the instruments that we use down here. And we make sure that they're hooked up, give them a quick little go at it. And then as Daniela explained beforehand, this articulating arm holder can be very fickle as well. And we need to make sure that all of the connections are, are appropriate and are securely fastened because the last thing we want to do is have the arm drop because of malfunction of the, the arm holder during the case. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's some certain instruments that we're going to use every single case. For me on this procedure, we're always going to use a 4.5 shaver to use for debriding, and we're going to use a 5.5 shaver to use for the acromioplasty, that's shaving down the bones for a portion of the case. Some people use an actual burr, and I think the point here to take home is that each surgeon is going to have different preferences on what it is that they like to use. And I think it's important that good assistants take notes for each individual surgeon that they work for, and they review those notes before every single case because there will be little bells and whistles that each of us will do differently. So I hope during this presentation that you don't get too caught up on the little bells and whistles it is that we're doing because that may change for your surgeon. And instead, you take home sort of the key points, which is one, to be organized, and two, to take your notes. And then we'll show you some basics of suture managing and the principles of how we're doing the, the rotator cuff repair along the way. Um, so we start typically by injecting lidocaine in the back of the shoulder. I'm going to put it right where my posterior portal would be. We put lidocaine just in the back of the shoulder and the skin here because the nerve block that we use doesn't always get the back of the shoulder. Some people use epinephrine in order to uh, constrict the blood vessels in the portal so the portals don't bleed. I found that that's unnecessary, but again, that's something that you, you very well may see. We're going to make the posterior portal here. Posterior portal is about two centimeters medial and two centimeters down from the later, posterior lateral edge of the acromion. And I'm just hitting the skin here. And then once I put this in, I'm going straight for the coracoid here, and we pop right into the joint. So here we are in the patient's down, shoulder please. here. Typically drop the lights in the room. It's here Daniela asking for. The camera can be white balanced outside. Uh, the shoulder. We like to white balance it again once we're in the shoulder. Then I like to take a quick little tour of the shoulder just to get a lay of the land. Here we see the patient's glenoid. That's the socket. You see the nice shiny white stuff on the socket. That's the cartilage. Here we see the ball. That's the humeral head here. Take a look up here. That's the subscapularis. That's one of the four rotator cuff tendons. That looks pretty good. We're going to come around here. We're going to look at the long head of the biceps tendon. Comes intraarticularly here. And as far as I can tell from that picture there, it looks pretty good. And then we're coming back here where the money is. This is the supraspinatus tendon. And we can already see that we have some damage in the supraspinatus tendon there because there's fraying here on the articular side. As we come back around the back here, we're seeing the infraspinatus. And then eventually somewhere in there, that's about the teres minor there. That looks pretty normal. And this is all consistent so far with our imaging that shows an isolated tear of the supraspinatus tendon. This is the inferior capsule here in the axillary pouch. We look for loose bodies down here. In certain cases of instability, you can see tears. This patient does not have a history of instability, so we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at that. Here's the labrum. You can see this patient has what we call degenerative labrum, where you see sort of the mop ends on the end of the labrum. That doesn't come from an acute tear. Uh, that just really comes more from wear and tear, and that's typical in patients that we see that are having rotator cuff surgery. So there's really two different angles of scopes that we use routinely. The 30 degree is really our workhorse. And, the, and on occasion, you'll use a 70 degree scope, which will help you see around corners or in tight spaces. 
through the way this works, you can see I'm holding the camera perfectly still here, but where this light source is means that my eyes are facing away from me. So my eyes are facing 30 degrees to the left, if you can see my scope here. And when I turn it this way, my eyes are now facing 30 degrees to the right. And one of the keys if you're driving the scope is really to not move the scope around very much at all. You want to try to keep your scope as still as possible. And then you can adjust the angle mostly by changing the light source around and playing with that 30 degree angle. The more you move your hand around, the more difficult it's going to be for us to orient ourselves. And the more damage you can cause too. Because while the scope is blunt, if you push through right here, you can scrape off some cartilage. And so you don't want to, you want to move around as little as absolutely necessary. If you look at the divot on the screen, that is where the light source is facing. So if you get confused during yeah. the scope, you can always just follow the divot. So this is what we call the rotator interval here. This is this patchless portion of the capsule right above the subscapularis tendon. It's really the capsule in between the subscapularis and the supraspinatus. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to make our portal here. We're going to isolate it or visualize it with a spinal needle to make sure we're in the right place. Once we've done that, I my assistant's going to remove the spinal needle. I'm going to nick the skin here, and then we're going to put a cannula in. Thin would just facilitates the passage of instrumentation back and forth. So the one thing that I haven't done that I want to do a little better right now in terms of my diagnostic arthroscopy is I want to pull the biceps tendon down and get a good look at the length and long head of the biceps tendon to determine whether or not this biceps tendon is going to need to be addressed, either with a biceps tenotomy that's cutting it or a biceps tenodesis, which means cutting it and then re-repairing it. And in this case, you see a little inflammation on the long head of the biceps tendon, but for the most part, that portion of it looks pretty good. Here, too, we see the biceps anchor. That's where the long head of the biceps tendon is inserting into the superior glenoid. Eventually, it goes on to the supraglenoid tubercle here. And that, too, looks pretty good with the exception of, again, this degenerative labrum, which we're going to clean up. My experience has been that it's unnecessary in the vast majority of cases to do a labral repair in the setting of a rotator cuff repair. Patients have a tendency to get stiff, and uh, they've been living a pretty long time with a labrum that looks like this, and this is not her problem. We're going to clean it up. So we're going to look at the tear here. I find it's a little easier to see the tear when we uh, forward flex and have the, or externally rotate the arm a little bit. Let me see the shaver. Four or five. We're using a 4.5 shaver here for all of our debridement work. We're just debriding the mop ends here to get a better look at what's happening with the tear. Now we're starting to get into the tear. Here we're localizing exactly where the tear is with the spinal needle. Now kind of getting the feel. It looks like there may be some tissue here, but the tissue that's here is really, really poor quality. I mean, my needle is able to very cleanly go through this tissue. So as such, we're going to go ahead and debride this. So I'm in a, we're in an anterolateral portal is what I'm working through here. But I'm really doing this percutaneously here. Just open it up, give us a little room to work with here. So let me see a shaver next. You can see my shaver now coming through that anterolateral portal and right through the defect in the rotator cuff. And here you can see that's really where the tearing all is, right here. I mean, the footprint should be about 15 millimeters. That's a centimeter and a half here. And you can see, really, you just had some wispy fibers here on the articular side, but the bulk of this tendon is all ripped off right here. And that's consistent, again, with what we saw on the MRI. So I'm just breeding some of the rotator cuff tendon here, trying to create some better visualization, get rid of some degenerative tissue here. We use this radio frequency device. Um, there's a couple different ones on the market. This just happens to be the one we use. 
And I come through and I'm getting rid of some of this mineralized fibrocartilage is what we call it. And that's the way the rotator cuff comes in and attaches to the bone. It goes through a fibrocartilaginous transition zone. So it goes from tendon to uh, fibrocartilage to mineralized fibrocartilage until it finally turns into bone. And when the tendon tears, it leaves some of that mineralized fibrocartilage still left on the bone, which can interfere with healing. So we want to make sure we get rid of that. But at the same time, we don't want to char the bone and burn the bone. So we want to provide a nice, healthy bed of tissue to repair the rotator cuff down to. So after I get rid of the mineralized fiber cartilage, I'm going to come back with my shaver. I'm just going to basically buff up here the footprint. This is the greater tuberosity right here. And this is what we call the rotator footprint because this is where the rotator cuff should be attached down to the bone here. I don't want to take too much bone off because if I take too much bone off, uh, it's going to decrease the pullout strength of the anchors that I put in. I really just want to abrade it. I want to get it down to some bleeding, which you can see I've done right there. That should be good. Good. All right. So that's all we're going to do inside the shoulder joint. We're now going to go into the subacromial space. I'll now bring the arm holder down to allow for more subacromial space. So um, what I'm doing here, when I put the scope in the subacromial space, I want to put it right under the acromion bone. And then I come and I, I come as anterior as I can, I can until I feel the CA ligament. This is all a real tactile sensation. You can actually feel the CA ligament and you can snap the CA ligament on the, uh, with the tip of the trocar. If I do that and I keep the scope pushed against the CA ligament, then put the scope in and turn on my light source, when I look, I should be looking right up at the CA ligament as I am right here. This is what we call a room with a view. I think a common mistake that people make when they put the scope into the subacromial space is that they're too far posterior. And if they're too far posterior, they have a veil of bursal tissue in their face and it can be very hard to see. So I think the... the the, th the way you combat that is you make sure that your scope is as anterior in the space as you possibly can. Here we see some uh, fraying on the undersurface of the CA ligament. Uh, that's the coracochromial uh, ligament here. And we call this an impingement lesion because what's below us here is the rotator cuff. That's the portion of the rotator cuff right there that also has some fraying on it as well. And uh, that very well may play some role in the propagation, at least, of a rotator cuff tear. So we're going to see a radio frequency uh, device. And I'm just going to take down the CA ligament. I need to make sure I'm on bone here because the acromion bone is should be right on the other side of the CA ligament here. I don't want to go through the deltoid. I like to do an acromioplasty with, uh, in conjunction with my rotator cuff tears, especially if there's that uh, impingement lesion on the CA ligament. It, uh, it opens up the space here. It uh, provides a little room for the rotator cuff to heal. It you know, takes some pressure off of the suture line once we do it. It also just makes it technically uh, a bit easier to work in this space once we've created a little room. There are some studies out now that show that with minimal bone spurs, type 2, which are really run-of-the-mill bone spurs, moderate bone spurs, which is really what this patient has. They have a type 2 uh, chromion. that You may not necessarily need to do this. Um, but, but again, we like to do it anyways because I do think it provides a little more space in here to work and probably helps with uh, some, some healing. One of the tricks here, too, is that um, the bleeders are anterior here. There's a thoracochromial artery that could be just anterior. And if you stray a little anterior, that's where you can get some bleeding. So... We take a picture of our bone spur. And again, this is the undersurface of the acromion bone. We cleaned off the CA ligament. You can still see some remnants of the CA ligament right here that goes down to the coracoid. If you were to follow it enough, which is right there. That way is the coracoid. Uh, and the rotator cuff is right below us. And all this other sort of junk you see up here is bursa, so the subacromial bursa. So now we switch to a 5-5 shaver for the acromioplasty. And Nina, um, being the excellent... Technician, she is, already has that ready. I don't even need to ask. So this is performing, again, the acromioplasty portion of it. Try to work lateral to medial. 
It's right here. This is the anterolateral edge of the acromion. It's about what I want to take right there. So you're sort of seeing that's the during. This is how much we're going to end up with. That's how much I need to continue to take off. So it's when we're doing any bony work, it's definitely not untypical to, to run into bleeding when you're doing this portion of it. Um, there's a couple of the bone bleeds and there's not a whole lot that we can do about it with the exception of play with pressures. And so we can combat the bleeding of bone by trying one to keep the patient's blood pressure low, to try to keep it as low as is safe. Uh, oftentimes, if it's 90 over 50 or so, that would be ideal, but we can't keep everybody's blood pressure that low because they have cardiac histories or a history of hypertension. Uh, the other thing is that we can increase the pressure on the pump. So I run my pump pressure at 50. That's something else that you should uh, keep in mind for various surgeons because they'll have different preferences in terms of what they like the pump to be. So if I am running into a lot of bleeding, we can always lavage that is give a bolus of fluid into the joint that really tamponades off the bleeding. So just want to, we know we're done when we have a smooth surface here. If you do, it's pretty much flat all the way across. And we're going to look at it from a couple different sides here. And then what I like to do is I like to take the scope out and I like to look from the lateral portal here. Just get to make sure that I'm nice and flat. So maybe a little bit there more anteromedially. You need to buff up a little bit. So I'll come from the posterior portal here. So this also, from this view, we call this the cutting block technique, that I can get a pretty good feel of what I'm doing here in if I've done enough of an acromioplasty. I basically just want that anterior acromion to be flush with the posterior acromion. Yeah, I think we're you know, pretty much there here. Good, so now we're going to switch back to a 4.5 shaver, do some more debridement. Nice thing I like about this is I've created this portal through really centered on the tear. So the tear should be right below me. So what I do is as soon as I finish the acromion, I have my eyes looking up and then I just turn my eyes down and I'm looking right at the bursal side or the top side of the rotator cuff. Yeah. Here are all this stuff, the cobweb stuff here. This is all the, the bursa that we need to clean up. But some of this is, you know, might bleed. Shaver device is a pretty uh, efficient way of getting rid of most of the bursitis that's here. But again, it can also cause some bleeding as well. There we're seeing the beginnings of the tear right there. Throughout the cannula. We're going to get that into the space in just a minute here. Then we're looking at the tear. So now we're looking at the, from the bursal side, subacromial space, we're looking at the rotator cuff tear. And this is really a, a nice, minimally retracted, isolated supraspinatus tear. Pretty good quality tendon that's remaining. These are the ones that you wish they're all like. <laughs> good. So what I can do now is I'm going to rotate the arm a little bit so that this is right underneath me. Take a nice picture of it. You can see the, the nice bleeding bone of the footprint that we've abraded uh, when we were looking from inside the joint. Spin a little. I like to percutaneously put in this anchor here. We're going to use what we call a transosseous equivalent double row rotator cuff repair. So we're going to put one medial anchor and we're going to put two lateral anchors. So let's open up one medial, two laterals. 
Okay. One helix advance and two swivel locks. Yep. So we're going to put these in percutaneously right off the anterolateral edge of the acromion here. It just helps with uh, suture management. It helps get a, a great angle. You want these Thank anchors you. to go in at about a 45 degree angle. It's what Steve Burkhart uh, coined the dead man's angle. That gives you the best biomechanical strength to resist pullouts. So we're just opening up implants on the back table. And this is, we're going to have almost a triangle type repair here. We're going to put one medial anchor. We're going to put the sutures from that anchor through the rotator cuff. I like to tie those sutures, uh, but we don't cut the tails. Instead, we load the tails of the sutures up into a knotless anchor that then we're going to place laterally. We're going to put two of those knotless anchors laterally to really plaster the whole thing down. We're going to try to restore the footprint. So this is our punch all device right here. You see I'm putting it up right at the articular margin right here. And uh, Daniela is going to give me a little tap with the, the mallet. Go for it. I'll start with a light tap so the guide does not skive off the bone. And I'll begin to tap a bit harder. Yes. Oh, good. Perfect. And now we'll tap it here. She's got pretty decent bone. I can tell from the resistance here. Thank you. Picture of that going in. Good, we want to make sure it's just below the surface. That was going to help me get rid of the packaging here. And the real key when we're doing this, you can see she has her hands there. She's holding the sutures and I'm pulling this out. You really got to be careful that you don't unload these sutures. You unload these sutures, it's, um, Thank you. it's not really a good thing. You're wasting uh, space here. So that's it with the sutures in. Perfect. So we'll do, let me see a spinal needle here. We're going to go ahead and make a posterior lateral viewing portal here. Sometimes we make this, sometimes we don't make it. I think we're going to make it because it allows us to see a little bit better what we're exactly doing here. I'm going to pull it. Let's choke our for the scope. So this would be pretty typical here in terms of our portal placement. We'd use five of these little portals. So we have our standard posterior portal, posterior lateral portal that we're going to use for viewing. We have our anterior lateral portal, which is going to be our main working portal. And then we have our anterior portal here that we're really going to use for suture management. Also make a little stab incision up here uh, to percutaneously put in the anchor. It helps with suture management and it also helps with uh, getting the appropriate angle of the anchor uh, when we put it in. So we like to use this clear twist-in cannula here. Really helps uh, keep everything organized and give you a nice portal to work through. The other thing we're doing, let me see choke heart for the bloom. I'm going to put this one up in the space so we can use it for our, our suture management here. Sometimes we take that out once we get going, but at least to create the space, we'll, we'll keep it in here. So these are really the two main cannulas that I use for a rotator cuff repair. Let me see actually the shaver back one more time. Pull on the, pull on the sutures. All right, see a claw. So there's really three main devices we're going to use here. We're going to use a suture retriever, which we call the, the claw. It looks like a crab claw. So this is a double loaded anchor. So while there's four limbs here, there's really two sutures. So this is you know, obviously one of the limbs of the purple suture. That's the other limb. Then we have two blue sutures in here as well. Having the color coded or different colors is really helpful because I know which limbs go which with, with which. And if we're doing a big uh, tear, where we're putting multiple medial row anchors in, it help, I try to alternate the colors even from anchor to anchor. So it'll go purple, blue, purple, blue, purple, blue. So uh, I know when I'm retrieving them, which ones go with which. We're using a suturing device here. It's really like a little sewing machine. And make sure we push those, those sutures out of the way. Come under. Now, we did not do a biceps tenodesis, so one of the important things is to make sure I'm not hitting that biceps tendon. See the biceps tendon right there? And you can see my device is right over the biceps tendon, but I want to make sure I don't accidentally grab it when I'm putting the suture through. See how it just puts it as a needle in there and really, again, sews it like a sewing machine. So the Suturing device is the second thing we use, and then the third device that we're using here is a grasper. So we use a little grasper in order to retrieve the sutures. 
out of the anterior portal. So I like to work anterior to posterior. You sort of have to work away from where you're retrieving. Otherwise, it becomes sort of a mission impossible matrix of sutures that you're working through. So for example, if I started posteriorly and I docked the suture out of the anterior portal, then as I put the more anterior sutures in, I'd have to try to navigate and avoid those sutures that are docked uh, anteriorly, which can be uh, tricky. When I'm retrieving these sutures, the, it's very important for the, uh, the first assistant to help grab the suture that I'm not retrieving so that I don't unload the anchor. The other thing that she's doing, you can see here, is she holds the cannula so that I don't pull the cannula out. So these cannulas have some ribs in them. You can see here some ribs in them, but, but they're not very strong. And if I just put that grasper in and pull the suture out, I can pull the cannula out. So she's holding the cannula. Here, when I'm retrieving this suture, what I'll do is I'll pull it out so that I have a loop. You can see I'm running it. They're both limbs are running right here. If I kept pulling that out, I would pull the entire suture out. So what I do in this case is I stop with a loop, and then I figure it out. So I pull one side. I'm running it. That's not the right side. And then I pull the other side and know that's the free end. That's the one that I'm going to retrieve out of the cannula here. Now, these two are connected here, so I can shorten it up and do what I want. Get it the appropriate length. It's important when I'm putting this in that I'm holding the slack here, too. If I don't hold that slack, it's all going to ball up in the cannula. So again, Danielle is holding the cannula for me. Nina already has the grasper ready for me. And it's really, it's claw, suture device, grasper. Claw, suture device, grasper, over and over again. So you see, here's where Danielle is really helping me here now because the other limb of this suture is docked out of the purple cannula right here and it's coming out right there. So if she just holds all the sutures that are coming out here, I can now just pull this one out and I'm not gonna unload the anchor. And that's very helpful and allows us to go a bit quicker here. And I know what the other limb of that suture is because obviously it's blue just like this limb and I can shorten it up if I want and make it a little easier to work with here. And I want even spacing really between them, between the sutures, a little over a centimeter and a half or so. The other real trick is if you're using one of these suturing devices, this needle can break, and there's an acromion bone right above us. So you got to deploy it pretty gingerly, and you don't have to hammer the whole thing down and uh, deploy the entire extent of the needle because what will happen in that case is the needle will come up, and it will hit the acromion bone, and it will break off, and you're spending time fishing out bits of needle instead of finishing the case. So now we're going to retrieve these out of the lateral portal. If I grab both of them and take them both out together, then I'm pretty comfortable. I'm not going to unload it. I'm using my clear cannula to make sure that these sutures are separated. They're not tangled. And now I'm going to tie my knot. There's a number of different ways to tie knots. I just do a surgeon knot. You find that using this knot pusher certainly helps. It's a necessity, actually. And then if you put a snap at the end of this, it actually helps me get a grip on it as well. Some people do that. Some people don't. So a surgeon's knot, just like you're tying a regular knot, not arthroscopic. It's the same as when you're doing it arthroscopically. You tie both the same way. Once I tie both the same way, I drop this limb. If I pick up this limb, I'm going to lock the knot. I don't, certainly don't want to lock the knot this far out of the cannula here. So now I'm just pulling the post, and I'm sliding the whole thing down. You have to make sure that the sutures slide in order to do this. So here, I'm pulling the post. I'm pushing down with the knot pusher, and now I'm going to push, pull up on this free end and lock the knot in this position right here. As I lock the knot, I'm what we call, I'm, um, I'm putting a past point here. So just like you would with your finger, this, this knot pusher really acts as your finger if you're tying an open knot. So now we're just going to back it up with half hitches here, just alternating sides, do an overhand throw, just do an underhand throw. I want to make sure that I'm putting each of these knots down square. That's about five knots or so that we're going to do five half hitches. So Danielle is holding the scope. I'm working with two hands here. Every now and then what I'll do is I'll guide her hand like I am now 
partly because it's not that she's not putting it someplace that I don't that I don't want it. It's it helps me triangulate. If you're holding your scope with one hand and I'm passing instruments with the other, over time your brain starts to put the two together, and it really helps you find yourself in space here, which is one of the uh, things that you have to learn when you're learning arthroscopy. It but, is important not to let go of the camera as the surgeon guides you, otherwise the camera will fall. Exactly. So make sure you always have a good grasp on the camera until he tells you to let go. Exactly. She doesn't let go of the camera until I tell her to let go of the camera. And when I'm doing it, I just kind of hold her hand and put it where I want, but then I'm going to drop it. And when I drop it, you know, she's going to continue to hold on to it. So this is the second suture we're tying. Again, two the same way. Drop it. Dress the knot. Pull the post. Load the knot. Pass point. Lock it. Back it up with half hitches, backhand, forehand. And you can see again, Danielle is not really moving her scope hand, so to speak. She's really more moving her eyes. The scope is in the same place throughout most of the surgery right here. And she's just adjusting her view by, uh, by moving the, her eyes back and forth, using that 30 degree feature on the scope. So we are retrieving these back through that percutaneous portal. It's just a convenient place to put these sutures here. And now we're going to get ready to do our lateral row. So here you see we have two what we call mattress sutures. So we've put both limbs through the tendon. I've tied them. We have posterior knot here. We have an anterior knot here. But I haven't cut the tails yet because we're going to use the tails to load them up into a, a lateral row anchor. So now we've got to create the space. We will put the lateral row anchor in. So we're going to clear off a little soft tissue here and kind of mark our spot. Another thing that's key that Daniela just did there that you might not be able to see was off camera is that when I put this radio frequency ablation device in my hand, the next thing I'm going to do is press the pedal. Sometimes these pedals, as I move around, they, um, uh, they're not convenient for me. So she's kicking the pedal, so it's basically right underneath my foot as I'm putting this in my hand, obviously anticipating that I'm going to have to use it. That's the key, really, to being a good assistant in any surgery is anticipating what the next steps are and then being ready for it. And I think that I feel good that a good assistant would be able to really finish this case if I wasn't able to. And they're, they're basically mentally or virtually doing the case in their own mind as well. One, it keeps them engaged, obviously. And two, it really makes them anticipate what the next thing is, the next step is. So you see here, I've taken one limb from each mattress. We're going to do a bit of a crisscross here. I'm going to park these out the lateral portal here. Nina's going to go ahead and load this up for me. This is our knotless anchor that we're loading up. Just going to snap that. So we're just going to let it dangle here. And now I'm going to prepare the, uh, the bone on the lateral side is usually pretty soft. You see, I pushed it in just like, like that without even using an, a mallet. That's why I like to tie the medial row. It's my own bias. You'll see there's some popular techniques now in which you do not tie the lateral row, or I'm sorry, the medial row. But I like to because I find more often than not that uh, this lateral bone here is pretty weak. So I'm tensioning the sutures with my left hand, and I'm anchoring this down or screwing it down with my right hand. And again, just so that it's right about there. the cutter. So now we're going to cut these sutures here. Those are the ones that were loaded up. This anchor has a free suture in it here that you can use if you need to. Sometimes we'll use it for um, dog ears. Maybe we'll do it here. You get a spectrum to the left. So we're going to try to pass this free suture through that anterior leaflet here. You've got to be careful a little bit because the biceps tendon underneath it there. So I'm going to dock one of these limbs. The whole key to this, this procedure is suture management. Be surprised how quickly, if you're not paying attention, you can make spaghetti out of this whole thing. So we're going to dock one of those. This is a spectrum device, we call it. There's a number of different things on the market they can use. This one's just not disposable, but there are ones that are disposable. It's got a suture in it that we're going to use to uh, shuttle. 
There we go. Grasper. And that's a PDS suture that we're using. That's going to shuttle one limb of the suture anchor. Took a real superficial bite there on purpose. I need to make sure these are coming through the same cannula here. So I want to make sure there's no tissue bridge between the suture that is the shuttle suture and the suture that's being shuttled here. Uh, if there's a tissue bridge between the two, then obviously I'm going to pull some of the deltoid fascia or so into the joint, and that's obviously not ideal. So what I'm doing here is just tying a half hitch. Danielle is going to load it up here right through the loop. We're going to tie that here, and now we're going to use that to, to shuttle right through the suture, right through the tendon here. Good. So now we need a claw. Retrieve both of these here. You know, since the stay suture is in there, we really we have a free suture. If we didn't want to do this, we just remove this suture. But I think that uh, since it's there, we will tack this down, make it look pretty. Okay, cutter. This one we are going to cut. When we cut it, we're going to leave just a little tail on it here. Just like that. Good. All right, here's this here. I'm going to rotate the arm because now we need to put a poster lateral anchor on posterior lateral anchor in here. So I'm going to I want to put this a, maybe a little more posterior in here. So I'm going to free up a little bit of the space here. One trick when you're putting in these lateral row anchors, you really got to be able to see the bone pretty well. If you can't see the bone, you're trying to go through soft tissue here. Uh, it's hard to get it to deploy. So you really want to be pretty aggressive with coming right down the bone, which we are right here. So we'll get both of these limbs here. All right, you're just going to load it up. Now we are going to use our punch here. You really want to make sure that there's enough of a bridge here. See, my, my other one's like right about there. And this one's going to go right about here. So that should be plenty of a bridge. Let's see, let's see a mallet in this case. <laughs> Nina does use a bit of ink to mark the tip of the guide. So if you do lose your spot on the bone, you'll just look for the ink mark on the bone. You can see that pretty well right there. Yep. Malefaction. Nose flush, and then let's take a look at what we did here. Best look from this portal right here. Got a touch of a bowl up in the back there. I don't think that's a big deal at all. That's one of those ones the enemy of really good is essentially better. So we're going to go ahead and remove the stay suture here, and this is going to be our finished product here. So the whole thing is tacked down here. So we have that one medial row anchor. The uh, two or four sutures go through it, which are really four limbs of two different sutures. Uh, we tie one knot anteriorly, we tie one knot posteriorly, you don't cut the uh, tails, instead you load one tail from each mattress up into a knotless anchor, the first of which I place on the anterolateral aspect of the proximal humerus. Uh, take a look and see if you have a dog ear, which we did in this case, and in that case if you have a dog ear you can use that spectrum device or any other sort of suturing device to pass a, a suture through it, which in turn then shuttles one limb of that free suture. We tie that down, tag down the dog ear. Then we uh, take the remaining limbs from each of the mattresses, place that through another knotless anchor, and put that one this time on the posterior lateral aspect of the proximal humerus. And here you have what we call the trans-osseous equivalent uh, repair of the rotator cuff. So what's happening now is uh, Daniela and Nina are going to close the incisions. We just use nylon sutures uh, in each of the portal sites. Sometimes that, that lateral portal can be a little bit uh, on the bigger side and uh, that can put a subcuticular, subcutaneous suture in, like a bicral suture, uh, and then close the skin with the nylon. A patient's going to be then put into a shoulder immobilizer and wheeled to the recovery room. They'll be in the recovery room for about two or three hours, and then we anticipate that they'll be able to go home uh, later this afternoon. Patient's then going to come back in the office in about 10 to 14 days. Between now and 10 to 14 days, 
they're just going to do some self-directed physical therapy. Our therapist is going to see them in the recovery room before they go home, show them some exercises, and then give them a handout uh, that they can refer back to. But really all we're doing in the beginning is we're keeping things fairly still and allowing the rotator cuff to heal. So all those range of motion exercises that we're going to work on immediately are distal range of motion. So they're working the elbow, the wrist, and the hand. And for somebody like her, we very well may start her doing some pendulum exercises where you let the arm dangle and you spin it around like the pendulum of a clock, like you would like this. <laughs> when we see her back in the office in around 10 to 14 days, we're going to get the stitches out, take a look at the wound, make sure her pain's well controlled, and then we're going to start formal physical therapy. It's a bit on the aggressive side, but what we'll do is we're going to do very gentle passive range of motion. I explained it in the very beginning. I don't want to get too far behind. I'm not really looking for the patient nor the therapist to make significant progress over the first six weeks, but I do want them to do something so that they don't end up with a frozen shoulder. They're going to wear the sling for somewhere between four to six weeks, depending on the size of the tear. The tear that you saw in that video uh, is going to be more of a four-week time point because it was a relatively small tear. But even for the first six weeks, we're not doing much in terms of active motion. At six weeks, uh, the rotator cuff should be sticky enough to be able to withstand more active range of motion, and that's what we'll initiate at that time point. So between six weeks and three months out from surgery, my goal is for the patient to get back all of their active and passive range of motion. At three months out from the surgery, they should have near full range of motion, they should have limited pain, and they should be able to do their activities of daily living with minimal to no discomfort. At that point, then, we'll start strengthening. That's pulling the bands, then progressing to lifting weights, and then eventually doing sports-specific activities that, for whatever it is that the patient's interested in getting back to. We anticipate that the patient would be able to get back to full activities somewhere between six to nine months following a rotator cuff repair surgery. Our results are a little over 90% of patients are happy with the results, but there are just under 10% of patients who have some complication or a poor outcome following the procedure. More commonly, patients can just either complain of pain, the rotator cuff can re-tear, it can never heal right in the first place, or they can get a stiff frozen shoulder, and we deal with each of those on a case-by-case -case basis. And once the surgeon scrubs out of the surgery, you can see that the arm is very swollen. We do use a lot of water during this case. So I do try to push out all of the excess water through the portals. The type of um, suturing I am doing is called the inverted figure of eight. Um, it's a nice suture because you can close each portal with only one stitch. And as you can see, it's still water permeable, and it will allow for excess water to drain out of the patient. Now, it's important to let the patient know after surgery that their dressing will be wet. And this is normal, and this is what we want. We want the excess water to be allowed to, uh, to drain out of the incision sites. I will now use a wet cloth to wash. And now we'll use a dry... Thank you. A dry towel, dry sterile towel, to clean off the excess water. Here we use some Xeriform on each incision, and the Xeriform will just help prevent the dressing from sticking to the patient's skin. Nina has already cut five pieces of the Xeriform, one for each incision. Beautiful. Okay, I will now remove my top glove. Sometimes there's some excess blood on the glove and you don't want the clean dressing to be contaminated. Thank you. Some sterile gauze. Thank you. Some sterile ABD pads. This will help soak off some of the excess, excess fluid also. And now we'll begin to take down the surgical field. I do always keep one hand on the sterile dressing as we remove the surgical drapes. Thank you. Now we can unhook the arm holder. Too much, just pulling it up for me. And I'll try to keep the arm in a neutral position. The nurse has pre-cut some tape to put over the incision, over the sterile dressing, I'm sorry. Thank you. Correct. So this type of brace does have a waistband for support. After surgery, we do not want the patient to externally or internally rotate their arm, and I'll show you how I place that. The first thing I do is place the patient's arm through the sling portion of the brace. I use my hand to guide the patient's hand. And again, making sure not to move the shoulder too much away from the body. You can use your body as well for that. 
the hand will go around this will go around this hand device. This serves as both an exercise uh, squeezy ball and also to just keep the hand in anatomic position. Place the strap around the patient's neck. These are usually one size fits all, so you will have to adjust the brace to the patient's size. These Velcro straps will be tightened. Perfect. This waistband also has Velcro. I do usually mold it to about the size of the patient. Undo the strap. This will go against the patient's waist, and then the sling will be placed right over this. So this will allow the patient to remain in a neutral position. The kidney post is now removed. We can take the, the helmet off first. Perfect. As the first assist, you are not leaving the patient's side. 